Miss Tyler and Mrs. Neal will be presenting chapter 13 from the book on empirical evidence on security returns. Starting off with the index model and single factor SML, we have the expected return beta relationship. Here's the formula for such. And then estimating the SCL, we have this formula right here. Put those all in. Uh, for the overview investigation, you have the capital asset pricing models, consisting of two parts. One being the optimal derivative uh, derivation, derivation uh, based on risk tolerance and the input list. Second being deriving predictions about expected returns and equilibrium. And then going into the test of capital. Uh, test return beta relationship on first pass regression, that being estimating beta, average risk premiums, and non-systematic risk. And then the second pass being uh, estimate, using estimates from the first pass to see if the model is supported by the data. And then you have the SML slope if it's too flat and then if it's too high. And then going to rules criticism, only th that being said, only the two testable hypotheses is whether the mark portfolio is a mean variance efficient. Sample betas conform to the SML relationship because all samples contain an infinite number of ex post mean variances, efficient portfolios. And then the CAPM is not testable unless we know that the use of exact composition of the true market. Benchmark errors due to proxy over M. Then going into the measurement error in beta. Uh, the problem, if uh, beta is measured with error, then the slope coefficient of the regression equation will be based, uh, biased downward. The uh, intercept will be biased upward. And then the solution for the constructed P with a large uh, dispersion of beta, then by ranting them, they yield insightful tests of SML. FAMA and both Macbeth. And then here we have a chart showing a summary of FAMA and Macbeth, given the period and different time uh, year spreads. And the summary of the CAPM tests, one being the expected rates of return are linear and increases the beta in the measure of systematic risk, two being expected rates of return are not affected by non-systematic risk. Going into the test of multi-factor CAPM and APT, three types of factors are likely augment market risk factor, uh, one being the hedge comps consumption against uncertainty in prices, second being hedge future investment opportunities, third, hedge assets missing from market index. And that includes the labor income such as the Myers model creating wedges between betas resulting in SML flat uh, and CAPM. Human capital of cyclical variations in asset betas. We have that, that word and way in studies showing two important deficiencies in tests of single index models. Many assets are not traded, notably human capital. Uh, human capital may factor may be important to explain returns going to uh, assets not traded. Second, if betas are cyclical. And then going into the evaluations of various capital specifications, you have this chart uh, showing the coefficients with A being the static cap M without human capital, B showing the conditional cap M with human capital. This is table 13.2 under textbooks. Um, here showing the earlier versions of multi-factor model, Chen, Roll, and Ross. Factors including growth rate and industrial production, second being changes in expected inflation, third unexpected inflations, Fourth, unexpected changes in risk premiums on bonds, and then finally, unexpected changes in term premium on bonds. Here's a study structure and results. So a method for two-stage regression with portfolios constructed by size based on market value and equity. You have A for E and W and Y and B. Um, some significant factors that go into this Study structure would be industrial production, risk premiums on bonds, and unanticipated inflation. Also, the market index returns are not significant in multi factor model. Uh, so, we have the average type factor models. So, this is a high book to market firms which experience higher returns. Smaller firms experience higher returns with a size and value or price and risk factors consistent with AP. Yeah. And here's a little graph of the differences. Uh, for risk-based interpretation, there's two different studies. 
uh, the Lou and Vassilo, uh, they seem to predict that GP, GDP growth and uh, it relates to the business cycle. At COVID, Zan say that in an expansion of the growth data compared to the value data, and vice versa for the recession. Uh, here's the difference in return for faculty. Here's the HML beta in different economic states, so you can see it in the P in expansion, the recession. Uh, the uh, behavioral ex explanation for value premiums, so for glamour firms, those are recent good performance, high prices, lower book to market ratios, high prices, those are excessive optimism, overreaction, and extrapolation of good news. And a few studies that looked at this were the Chankresky and that guy, Laporta, that guy, Schleifer, and Vishnu. Here's a graph of the book to market ratio with the median growth rate at the beginning and the end and the end. And another graph of the value minus glamour returns, value earnings. And you, can, uh, yeah, so you can tell that each year it gets lower and lower. Uh, so momentum, it's another factor. The original FAMA French model plus the momentum factor, it evaluates abnormal performance of the stock portfolio. Winners minus losers, it's the winners and losers based on the past returns. So when it comes to liquidity and asset pricing, liquidity involves trading costs due to sale, necessary price concessions to affect a quick transaction, market depth and price predictability. The pastorants, Dombog study price reversals, they occur when traders have to offer higher purchase prices or accept lower selling prices to complete their trades in a timely manner. So the conclusion is liquidity risk is a price factor. Here's a graph of the liquidity and asset prices of the Kappa and Alpha and the Pharma French Alpha. Here's the consumption growth and market rates of return. So what, market, what matters to investors is not their wealth, but their lifetime total consumption. So measure risk as a covariance of returns with aggregate consumption. Then here's a graph of annual returns and consumption data. The top is the excess returns and the bottom are the consumption data. So here's another graph of the FAMA French 25 portfolios from 1954 to 2003. You can see all over the place. So liquidity and the equity premium puzzle, part of the equity premium is almost certainly compensation for liquidity risk rather than just the systematic volatility of returns. Thus, the equity premium puzzle may be less of a puzzle than it first appears. And the behavior explanations are Barbaris and Huang explain this puzzle as an outcome of irrational investor behavior. The premium is a result of the narrow frame of the puzzle. So that is our presentation. Thank you. You were too good, no questions. But are you following along on everything? You, you, you are? Because I know that <coughs> when you guys play golf, it's just like classic stuff. So you're okay? Yeah. Okay. I would go ahead and uh, pull out your blue uh, book and the exam. We'll continue to work on the, the presentation, the dissertation presentation. 
So we already went through, and you should have the, from these uh, uh, the printouts that I gave you. From this, I already gave you the printout of the presentation, okay, so you can work from it too. Okay. So we already talked about the motivation of the research, which was to build a strategic portfolio strategy for the multi-billion dollar REIT, which had no portfolio strategy before. They were just buying assets where the assets became available, and that was pretty much a uh, a failing strategy to, to be pretty much ad hoc. They needed a strategic research um, portfolio strategy where they could raise uh, multi-billions of dollars from institutional and retail investors in the public markets as a publicly traded company. Without a strategy, nobody's going to give you any money. Okay? You've got to be able to communicate it. Uh, and that was basically the business case, was to be able to track the capital and then be able to deploy the capital based on a strategy. And if we're getting multi-billion dollars, billions of dollars in new equity and new debt issuance, we can drive down our weighted average cost of capital and maximize the spread between the IRR and the weighted average cost of capital, which theoretically is called the economic value add. You may want to write that down as a note because you don't have an intermediate financial management course here at St. Mary's. You would be learning about EBA and market value add or MBA in an intermediate class if you had one that was offered. Uh, how was the research to be commercialized and used by the sponsoring firm? Again, it was to communicate to the institutional investors, the portfolio managers, the REIT equity analysts, uh, the consultants, the advisors, um, everybody that was scrutinizing us. Um, that's how we'd be, we would commercialize it. And we used a lot of the research and a lot of the strategy here in investor relations and in the conference calls, the quarterly conference calls, and the annual uh, meetings you know, to the board of directors. So we were using a lot of the research across pretty much the whole uh, enterprise. How was the research and the products used by the market and clients? Again, it was transparency that we were providing. We were giving them a full view of what our strategy was. And then we were able to prove over time, um, since we were there, I was there for almost 10 years, we were able to show that the uh, portfolio strategy and the market strategies were valid because we were able to outperform our peers on a consecutive basis. You need anything? I think I gave all of them now. I just have one. Maybe somebody has an extra buried in their notebook somewhere. Uh, what is the research mission? Again, to come up with the allocations, to come up with the geographic allocations, the portfolio allocations, to then uh, make the recommendation to management. 
the geographic all allocations should be set and then fully allocated over a three to five year period. Okay? Uh, you can also print this out um, from the website. Okay? Uh, what are the research goals and objectives? And again, we went over, went, went over these uh, uh, on Friday too. And again, the objective was to come up with a optimal allocation by geography and to be able to select uh, markets, not only at the metro level, but also at the sub-market level. And before I left, I was actually designing a uh, property selection methodology that would actually, excuse me, um, that would actually, um, if you guys are going to um, talk, will you whisper into each other's ear softly um, so that that way it doesn't disrupt me? Thanks. Um, and then the research questions, what are the research questions, what are the hypotheses that were tested, again we went through that. Literature review, uh, we use the books particularly the Markowitz books, the Bodie Kane and Marcus books. Uh, I did the peer review journal article searches to identify uh, research, both industry and academic, that had been done prior um, to get some external validation. Uh, we had multiple, multiple data sources um, that we used. I probably had about a dozen data sources um, that I used, pull, pulling it together into a, a database uh, from multiple sources, and then also using these uh, data sets to mine the data um, using stepwise regression and other types of data mining techniques to find variables and factors that were predictive using uh, big data uh, types of applications. Um, economic and finance theories uh, used, well, obviously, modern portfolio theory, uh, multi factor modeling, PPT. Economic forecasting methodologies. And then what I was getting into here was the, what I've been basically telling you over the last uh, year and a half, two years, depending on how long you've been taking my classes, is you're operating in a more volatile environment than any portfolio manager has ever uh, basically operated in uh, in history. Um, since the uh, peso crisis and high bot prices, the Russian default, and the Y2K, and the dot-com boom, and the, and the housing boom bust, and the financial crisis, uh, we're starting to see more uh, crises and more volatility in the markets that you're going to have to handle um, being portfolio managers and equity analysts. A lot of the analysts and all the managers don't want to deal with the reality of increased volatility. Um, they want to assume that things are going to stay in growth phase and things are going to go up for, forever, but they don't. Things become volatile, things crash, markets get disrupted, and that's when the finance and the economic theories break down. And if you just look at GDP um, over the years, um, the last financial crisis that we had was basically a six sigma event, and the, uh, the rate of economic destruction uh, was extremely severe. And you have to go back to the 1950s to find periods that are analogous to the volatility that we saw in the last financial crisis. So I think that this volatility, just like the volatility after post-World War II, is probably going to be a, a natural situation in the capital markets. And I think the next financial crisis may be just as uh, severe as the last one. Hopefully it won't, but it might be. So we're just looking at more systemic risk. We're looking at more inflation volatility. So the inflation risk premiums are wider now than they've ever been. Uh, you're looking at yield curve <coughs> shifting now, flattening and then inverting that you guys haven't dealt with that we haven't really seen in 10 years. Uh, you look at the VIX index, uh, the volatility in the early 90s and the 2000 period, the volatility of the stock market indexes were completely blown out to new levels in the financial crisis. Again, you're looking at more stock market volatility, and then just looking at spreads. I mean, the last financial crisis was unbelievable because you had spreads. These are commercial mortgage-backed security spreads and uh, residential spreads. And the subprime and the Alte um, spreads uh, jacked about 4,000 to 3,500% over the uh, swap curve or over the treasury curve. This has never happened before. In 1998, when the Russians 
defaulted the spreads blew out about 250 to 500 basis points. In the last financial crisis, they blew out by 5,000 basis points. So from 500 to 5,000. So you're looking at even more credit default risk than, than ever before that you have to deal with. And the derivative contracts don't work. Usually they're a pretty good hedge to credit default and interest rate, uh, rising interest rates and other macro factors. The swaps are actually prudent uh, hedging tools. But in the last financial crisis, the tools didn't work. The, uh, the volatility was so extreme that uh, you couldn't clear the derivative contracts. You couldn't even buy portfolio insurance. It was too expensive. And the counterparty risks were non-existent because the banks were basically insolvent. So we may be looking at another situation where if you did apply derivative contracts to hedge off your default risk or your interest rate risk, the counterparties may not be there uh, to be able to clear those trades. And the question will be, will the Fed step in and print another $5 trillion bucks? I don't know. <coughs> we'll see. So just more volatility. And here's your triple Bs. These are your credit spreads. Uh, the triple B tranches you know, for the CMBS and some of the RMBS, commercial mortgage-backed securities, blew out 10,000 basis points over the Treasury curve. When the... When the spreads widen to 10,000 over, what's the value of your bond? T test question. Test question. When the spreads on your bonds, particularly the, the B pieces and the junk pieces, widen by 10,000 basis points, what's the value of your bond that's sitting on the bank's balance sheet Zero. or on the sovereign? What is it? Zero. Got it. Got it. Zero. So when it blows out 10,000 over, that's basically a 100% yield to maturity, which means your bond's worthless. Okay. And then who's gonna, what's going to happen to the, balance, the bank's balance sheets when they're writing down the value of these bonds to zero? Well, it wipes out the equity, the owner's equity, the capital on the right side of the balance sheet because you, you're writing down the assets. Well, you're writing down the assets, the, bond, the bonds are basically set in place. So any write down of the assets, and assets have to equal liabilities, when you write down the assets, it blows out the, the, the owner's equity. And when the owner's equity is gone, the bank is insolvent. And if the public hears about that, you're gonna get runs on the bank. So that's what they basically did, was the Fed recapitalized the banks. They swapped off the worthless bonds for treasury securities. And then they recapitalized the banks, basically semi-nationalized them. To keep the banks from, uh, them uh, created a panic, a bank panic, and massive runs on the bank. We, we came close. Uh, Greece didn't get out of it. Ireland didn't get out of it. Spain didn't get out of it. Um, Portugal didn't get out of it. A lot of the European banks uh, uh, got run on, and people were panicking to get money out of those banks. Uh, we were able to save our banks, but they weren't able to save their banks because they're not the federal reserve. Okay. But I thought that that was a uh, basically shows the degree of uh, credit default risk um, embedded in the marketplaces. And if you look at real estate pricing. Uh, REIT securities dropped 75 percent from peak to trough um, in uh, 2006 and 7, 2008, 9. Can you imagine if you were a portfolio manager or an investor in REIT securities and you saw the value of your securities drop 75 percent? Would you be happy? No. I mean, they did eventually recover and were about almost 200 percent higher than we were off the bottom because of over-accommodated monetary policy. But this is hard to stomach, something like this. Will it happen again? Maybe. How do you deal with it as a portfolio manager? This is what you're going to have to do. Okay. <clears throat> so the, the question was, where's the volatility coming from in asset prices? Well, we already know that you know, we have the CAPM equation. Okay, is the determination of the discount rate or the cost of the equity. You can put this into a real estate uh, income capitalization model. The cap down becomes the discount rate. And you divide it into the NOI and it gives you the value. So the variability in valuations for real estate and real estate backed securities either comes from the NOI or it comes from the discount rate. Or it comes from the future cash flow projections or it comes from the discount rate and the present value. These NOIs and the NOI cash flow growth rates basically are highly correlated to the business cycle. 
and you can forecast them pretty easily if you know where the markets are going. So where does the volatility come from? It doesn't come from the numerator. It comes from the denominator. It comes from interest rate volatility, systematic risk, and market volatility. So that's really important to understand, is that it's really monetary. Not We've kind of moved away from economic fundamentals as the main driver of intrinsic values or assets and moved more towards relying on over-accommodated monetary policy to basically cause intrinsic values to go up. Well, if monetary policy is overly accommodated and they drive down interest rates, which you already know, zero or negative, it's going to prop up asset prices. What happens when they start taking away the liquidity? What happens when they start selling off the bond portfolio? What happens when they start raising interest rates? The markets go into convulsions. They're going to go into, and the stock market you saw was down almost 1,000 points last week due to rising interest rate convulsions from the market. The bond market was the same thing. It was a sell-off in the stock and the bond market simultaneously, which is very rare, due to convulsions due to rising interest rates. And now with rising interest rates, the real estate market is coming next. That will convulse also. We're already starting to see it at the lower end of the single-family housing market. Uh, home prices are starting to deteriorate at the lower end of the market because people at the low end of the market, the economic spectrum, are more, more sensitive to rising interest rates. And they used adjustable rate mortgages that are tied to short-term interest rates. So as their mortgage rates start to adjust, they start to convulse. And what you're start, starting to see as I drive around these neighborhoods is I'm seeing more for sale signs because those people are very sensitive. And it is the peak of the market, so why wouldn't you sell? And pocket the two fifty dollars or $500,000. If you're married, you, know, you can sell your house and not pay any tax on, on $500,000 in capital gains in your home. If you're single, two fifty. dollars Why wouldn't you sell at the peak of the market in a rising interest rate environment and pocket a half a million bucks tax rate? It's pretty good. So the bottom of portfolio theory application, again, you've seen this before. Why would you put real estate in stock bond portfolio? Because it bows out the efficient criteria. It increases the risk adjusted rate of return. So you want real estate within the portfolio. That's the first question that needs to be asked when we were, when we were marketing this program, is why would we put real estate in our portfolio? Again, you gotta come up with an economic argument. Then the next thing is they said, well, what, why would you put apartments? You know in your real estate portfolio, and you gotta make that case. Then why would I put you know, your REIT you know, in our REIT portfolio? So these are all the questions that we had to ask, methodically using uh, real estate and finance and economic theory to articulate it because those are the economics, that's the language we need to use to communicate to the investors and to communicate to the other stakeholders involved in this capital. market analysis. So real estate markets go through cycles. They go through four phases of, this, of cycles. You start here, there's no supply down here, and you're in a recession, basically. No demand, no supply. This line right here is occupancy rates, net absorption, and rent growth. Okay. Then all of a sudden, you get an employment demand shock. The economy starts to recover from the recession. Demand starts to increase, job growth, net absorption, occupancy rates, and rental rates start to improve. There's no new construction at this point because they're basically burning off any existing inventory that may be in the marketplace. Then you reach the first equilibrium point in the marketplace. Uh, this is the structural occupancy rate. Structural occupancy rate is E1. The structural occupancy rate for commercial real estate is 90% occupied. At 90% occupancy rate, or 95% for apartments, that's your structural vacant occupancy rate. At the equilibrium point, your rents are growing at the local inflation rate. Okay. So then as demand continues, there's still no su new supply coming into the marketplace, the rents start to spike. And this is your rent spike zone right here. And rents will start to spike by between 20 and 40 percent. And you saw it in the Bay Area. You saw it in the late 80s, you saw it in the late 90s, you saw it uh, just recently in, in uh, well, just recently.
2000, probably 13 through 15, you had rent spikes in rents and uh, commercial uh, rent spikes because there's no real uh, supply coming online. Then after the rent spikes, the values exceed the cost of construction and the developers start to move into the marketplace. As the new supply comes in, it starts to push down the occupancy rate. Usually by this time, this is around three, four years before you move into, the, into zone three. By this time, we're late in the economic cycle and the employment is starting to slow and GDP is starting to slow. And actually GDP could be, be starting to, to turn, turn towards zero. So now you have falling demand. You have more supply because supply lags in commercial real estate. You can't just shut it down because you have, you know, when you're constructing something, there's usually a performance bond that is taken out that basically states that the developer has to complete the project. So even though the markets are starting to deteriorate, new supply is coming online because there's a lag effect in supply. So you're starting to see a slowdown in the economy. You're seeing still more supply coming online. Your occupancy rates are dropping. Your rental growth rates are starting to slow. The price appreciation rates are starting to slow. Um, but you're still above the equilibrium point. Your rents are still growing above the local inflation rate, which continues to encourage more capital to come into the marketplace as they see that the benchmark, they're still exceeding the benchmark. Then, at some point, you move past the equilibrium point. Now your occupancy rates are below the structural. You start to see negative rent growth. You start to see negative net absorption. You start to see uh, falling occupancy rates. You're starting to see falling valuations, and you're in an oversupply condition at this point, too. The construction is starting to get shut down here. The capital is starting to shut off. You're still in an uh, oversupply condition, and you're moving into the recession. This is the worst part of the whole cycle here. Uh, there are some people that would buy in here, the contrarians, the risk-neutral investors, and there are people that will buy down in here the contrarians and the risk neutrals because people try to time the real estate market because it moves so slowly compared to the stock market and the bond market which reacts instantaneously to new information. There's a few uh, inverse uh, ETFs. Why don't um, investors just invest in those when the market's going down? Instead? Uh, these, this is direct. This is not securitized real estate. This, but it's a good point. Why would you could pop use the reverse ETFs as maybe a hedging strategy, using the liquid markets to hedge off the downside risk within your direct, direct uh, exposures. Uh, I'm a big proponent and advocate of using the public markets to hedge off risk in the private markets and vice versa. But the problem is, is most direct real estate investors are not read, read investors, and most read investors are not direct investors. It's only at the institutional level or the family office level, uh, or the high net worth level that you'll have sophisticated investors that actually uh, uh, invest in both markets, or would even understand how to use the reverse ETFs or going short or you know, writing calls or buying puts to hedge off some of your market exposure. That's a pretty sophisticated uh, strategy. But yeah, I think it's a valid strategy. How about you on that? Uh, this is the microeconomics around real estate, and it's very different than um, stocks and bonds. Um, because the supply curve in the short run is completely inelastic. I can't just instantaneously build, you know, uh, 2 million or 20 million square feet in downtown San Francisco. It's going to take me 10 years to do it. So the supply curve doesn't adjust. It just slowly over time, as new construction comes into the market, but in the short run, the uh, supply curve is completely inelastic, which is very unique um, for an asset class. Um, so what you'll do is you'll get the demand shock, employment demand shock, which will cause the demand curve to spike up. And because there's no shift in supply, you have prices and rents that will spike up. And then slowly over time, as new construction comes into the marketplace, uh, the supply will start to move out and then the market will move back into its long-term equilibrium. And once the market is in equilibrium, um, your rents are growing and your values are growing at the local inflation rate. And in this period here, uh, the rents and the values are 
growing and appreciating well above the local inflation rate. This is where you get the, the valuation and rent spikes. Now, in commodity markets, Tucson, Sacramento, Dallas, um, Austin, Texas, um, you know, those desert mountain, you know, southern states where land is infinite, you know, they would love it if you came and built it if you want to build, you know, in Texas or if you want to build in Albuquerque or Tucson, or San Antonio or even Sacramento or even the Inland Empire. It's just come on, bring it on. We'll permit that thing. Uh, we'll push it through and you'll be able to complete it in less than uh, 12 to 24 months. Uh, what happens is because there's infinite amount of supply in these markets and they promote and push residential and commercial construction as economic development policy, these markets become overvalued and the supply curve actually overshoots uh, in these markets. It's boom bust. Uh, so these markets are highly volatile um, and you can move from boom bust uh, very quickly. When I was working for the REIT, I, you know, I recommended you not go into commodity markets, stay away from commodity markets. If we can buy and build in supply constrained markets, uh, we'll always outperform uh, the uh, local inflation rate, and that's all we need to do is to outperform the local inflation rate uh, within a supply constrained market, and our valuations are going to go up constantly over time, and the value of the firm is going to be maximized slowly over time. You want to play in these commodity markets. We're going to get caught um, one of these days, and we're going to have to liquidate the portfolio below replacement cost because we got slammed by new supply. So the, the micro, mac, microeconomics were really important to communicate. Um, let me step back a little bit here, too. Um, here's an example where the market you know, reaches its equilibrium. In these supply constrained markets, the supply curve is constrained due to infill or nimbyism or environmental constraints or regulatory oversight, you know, that make it really hard to build. So these supply constrained markets, they can't reach the equilibrium, lower the equilibrium point. So they end up landing in some midpoint, which means that the prices and the rents always remain well above the long run uh, intrinsic value and the rents always grow over the long run, well above the local inflation rate. So this is the microeconomic argument for supply constrained markets. This is the argument for not going into commodity markets because of the threat of uh, oversupply shocks that occur in those markets. And we sold off, uh, my recommendation <coughs> to the board was to buy a billion dollars in Southern California and to also buy in Northern California and Seattle and less so in Portland Utah. And they ended up selling off Tucson, Albuquerque, and Sacramento, and then uh, they eventually uh, sold off Phoenix and liquidated their mountain and desert state portfolio and deployed the capital into uh, North Hollywood, Beverly Hills, uh, Century City, uh, supply constrained markets, class A sub markets in Southern California, and then doubled down on Silicon Valley uh, in uh, West Side Santa Clara. The other thing that's really interesting, too, um, from a microeconomic standpoint, is here where you have a complete elastic supply curve. Remember, the real estate markets were completely inelastic. Here's an example of a completely elastic supply curve. This is what the microeconomics looks like for derivative contracts. Okay? And this was my argument for property derivative contracts, or one of the industrial market structures of the derivative markets, is how much does it cost, you know, the demand curve increases for derivative contracts, how much does it cost me to write a derivative contract? How much would it cost me to write a derivative contract? I got somebody on the other side that wants to buy a forward, I want to write a forward. How much would it cost to basically put that deal together, to write that contract? However much you pay to learn. Yeah, probably, and how much, what, like uh, 5,000 bucks? Yeah. Okay, maybe, uh, how much is a pen and a piece of paper? Nothing. So basically I can write a, let's say it costs 50,000 bucks. I can write a multi-billion dollar uh, forward contract for basically 50,000 bucks. So the transaction costs are nothing. 
So that's, that's what these banks were doing uh, leading up to the financial crisis. They were writing and buying uh, derivative contracts amongst themselves and basically levering up their banks using off-balance sheet contingent liability products. That then when the financial crisis hit, a lot of the counterparties defaulted. A lot of those derivative contracts were basically worthless. And that would have hit the bank's balance sheet significantly and impaired the bank and caused a run on the bank. So the Federal Reserve decided that what they would do is print basically $2.5 trillion and buy all that crappy stuff off of Lehman and Bear and B of A and Wells and Goldman and clean up their derivative balance sheets. And this stuff is actually occurring now, too, because under Dodd-Frank, they've circumvented the clearing and the writing and the buying of the derivative contracts, particularly over the counter, in the United States, in what the top five and top 10 uh, multinational banks, money center banks did, is they rerouted the derivative trading through London and through Shanghai and Singapore. So they circumvented the United States to continue to build their book and derivatives outside of Dodd-Frank and outside of the US regulatory oversight. So the derivatives will come back to probably haunt us again at some point. So getting into real estate within a capital markets context. So the next was to, uh, this section was to analyze risk adjusted returns for competitive financial and real estate capital market asset portfolios. The results show that risk averse institutional investors are better off investing in apartments, the West, Western region, apartments in the West. Reed investors were better off investing in Western apartment companies based off of the research. Uh, the uh, desert mountain states, so like uh, Arizona, not Wyoming, uh, Nevada, uh, California, Pacific Northwest were the, uh, were the primary states. Mostly California had the best performance over the long run. Um, so I used what was called the NACREF index, uh, which is a valuation index that was designed by Jeff Fisher and uh, Blake Baird out of uh, Chicago in the early 80s as a benchmark so that pension funds and pension fund advisors could benchmark their real estate portfolios against a, an established benchmark to be able to calculate alpha also and see if they outperformed. So this was basically the methodology. You've seen this all before. Uh, high return, low risk portfolios, high return, high risk portfolios, low return, high risk portfolios, and low return, low risk portfolios. Maybe if you're, you know, ultra conservative, do you want to be out here? Maybe if you're a contrarian investor, uh, do you want to be up here? Yeah, if you're a risk neutral investor, and if you're a risk averse investor, you want to be up here in the upper left hand corner. So what I did was I basically took quarterly returns for the different asset classes, calculated the mean and the standard deviation, and then plotted them within a efficient frontier capital market. And it made sense, you know, you got your REITs and your S&P 500, high risk, high return, and then you had your real estate assets uh, down here, relatively lower return, but significantly lower risk. So higher risk adjusted rates of return. What I was trying to do through this whole process was to say, why should you put real estate within a stock bond portfolio? Well, if you say yes, then what should be the, uh, the allocation within the real estate portfolio? And then if the answer is yes, then it's what rates do you want to buy uh, to gain this market exposure, uh, assuming or assuming away systematic risk from publicly traded securities. So here's where apartments uh, ended up, which I thought was amazing. It gave you high return and low risk. Not bad. I take it. And it's a durable asset, too. Then I just showed the standard deviations, the mean returns, and then I just took the return to risk ratio and sorted them. And this is, uh, remember the uh, chapter that you just looked at, the behavioral finance chapter? This is behavioral finance, application. This is applied behavioral finance. Because not only what I did was I looked at the return to risk ratios and sorted them, but also said, here's the risk averse investors. These are the asset classes that risk averse investors are gonna wanna hold. Because they provide the highest risk adjusted rate of return. If you're risk neutral, you're gonna have most of your money in uh, the S&P 500 and REITs and corporate bonds, which, which makes sense. 
And then if you're contrarian or if you're uh, uh, opportunistic, you're going to be in REITs and the S&P 500 and government bonds. Uh, I did the, I said, okay, well, if it's, what about the other property sectors? Let's uh, have them compete. So apartments, again, low return, high, low risk, high return. So again, I was just making the argument based on the unbiased research that really your invest, the majority of your investment should be in apartment in the apartment sector. And apartments are, are the best sector because the demand for apartment units, which is housing, is driven by not only demographics, but also jobs, economics. And apartments get a preferred financing through the government-sponsored entities, such as Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, give them preferred loans that they can use because they're in the, the housing business. So they have not only a capital market comparative advantage, but they also have a demographic and economic demand comparative advantage over the other asset classes, or the, over the other property sectors, and it shows up in this continuum. So again, apartments. And again, I ran, re ran the methodology, looking at risk-adjusted rates of return, Again, risk-averse investors, you should be in these asset classes. This is where the majority of your allocations should be. If you're risk-neutral and you're just looking for return, then you want to be in apartments, retail, and warehouse. So actually, apartments had comparative advantage in returns. And if you're risky and contrarian, you would be in office, R&D, and in just overall real estate altogether. So this was a behavioral finance. So keep taking notes. Let's keep doing real estate stuff. Um, rework your, your reports, you know, so that they're perfect.